Hello everyone, this is Dan Noble as Avedra, teaching you right now the module 1. Alright, so let's begin now, shall we? Alright, so first is the objectives overview. So first we will describe various computer and mobile device cases and the contents they protect. Second we will describe types processors and its parts. And third we'll identify characteristics of processors and describe the ways they are cooled. Okay, and then fourth we'll explain advantages and services of cloud and then define a bit and describe how a series of bits represents data. Then explain how program and application instructions transfer in and out of memory. Okay, and then also we will differentiate various types of memory. We will also describe the purpose of adapter cards, explain the function of a bus, explain the purpose of power supply and batteries, and then lastly uh, we will try to understand how to care for computers. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about inside of computers and mobile devices so let's uh, read the meaning or the definition of case first so case contains and protects the electronics of the computer or mobile device from damage so as you can see right here uh, we have a case of a personal computer a case of an all-in-one computer a case of a laptop and a case of a tablet and so on and so forth so all of those cases serves one purpose only we're in to protect the electronics that what what is ever inside of those uh, devices, All right? So next, we have the inside the case of a computer. So this is one example. So as you can see right here, this is a pretty good computer. All right. So system unit. So what are things that are inside the system unit? So first we have the power supply, a power cable, a case. And a fun and then a cpu and a fun so it's like uh they're like a twin actually so you can just use uh, a fun without a heatsink or a heatsink without a fun so it's like a two in one okay and then we have an input and output and then a rom uh, a cd rom and the case itself and then the hard disk uh, hard hard disk drive and then a fluffy drive uh, data cables those one and then the motherboard one and then the battery or the CMOS battery okay so first let's talk about the motherboard okay so motherboard is a sheet of plastic that holds all the circuit read to connect the various components of a computer system so as you can see right here here's some basic parts of a motherboard so this is where you put your CPU uh, here's the IO or the no sorry here's the back panel connectors rather okay and then here's the memory slot and then the storage drive connections and then the expansion slots or adapter cards uh, where you can put your uh, VGA, sound card and other uh, peripherals or at our other adapter cards that you can put in there okay next will be the processor okay so processor is sometimes called just a processor or a CPU okay so CPU stands for central processing unit so it is uh, the logic circuitry that responds to and processes the basic instructions that drive a computer so we have here an example of a processor for the Intel and then another processor for the AMD so it's a counterpart or those two are actually rivals with each other those two companies are you know competing with each other which one is better okay next how does a processor work so we have we actually have uh, four parts on how does a processor work so first we have instructions so instructions what what is this instructions so it is the instruction set it is a list of actions the processor perform all right so what are those so for example you click the letter a on your keyboard that is already an instruction you're, you're asking your computer to do something wherein maybe you want to display the letter a maybe you want to uh click enter you want to click escape you know something like those and then we have a c or a control unit it coordinates activities okay so it is the one um lining up the things that you want your computer to do like for example uh, you're typing right now and then at the same time you're listening to a music and then at the same time you're downloading something and then at the same time what could it be uh 
you 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 you're trying to multitask. You you're doing a lot of things. So it is the one that is uh, responsible for uh, aligning which one should be prioritized, which one should be you know get idle, or which one should be finished first or last, you know something like that. And then for Alu, it is the arithmetic logic unit. It carries out calculation and comparisons. So in this one, let's say you ask your computer to uh compute something say you've opened your calculator you want to solve something let's say 10 times 10 so in clicking or upon clicking the equal sign it is the alu or the arithmetic logic unit that will carries out the calculation and comparisons okay and then lastly is the memory it is a set of storage areas called registers upon which the alu acts directly so basically our processors nowadays has a memory okay or even for it already has a memory wherein it can uh, store small information okay let's say uh, you ask your computer to solve for 10 times 10 it will store those information that 10 times 10 to your memory okay so we call that one registers it is a one uh, responsible port temporarily holding the data and instructions to your processor okay so we have here an example the base of a system clock is called the clock speed and is measured in gigahertz okay so our processors nowadays has a certain clock speed so before maybe it's just megahertz wherein it runs in a million clock cycle but nowadays we have gigahertz wherein it runs in a billion clock cycle so it's much much faster so 3 gigahertz has 3 billion clock cycles in one second next so how does cpu operates okay so here we'll be discussing cpu operations or machine cycle so in here we actually have four primary functions of a processor so those are fetch decode execute and write back so in here i've only list three function the other one is super simple okay first is fetch uh, it is an operation which receives instructions from program memory from a system ram so what does it mean so in every instruction that you do or the uh, everything that you do to your computer you click your letter a you press your one you press two and so on and so forth it does those uh, four functions okay it fetch or it receives an instruction the second the code so it's pretty obvious it is where the instruction is converted to understand which other parts of the cpu are needed to continue the operation so it is where being decoded so basically uh, our computer can only read one and zero so if you press letter a it will not be uh, or your computer is not reading that as symbol letter a but it will read it as uh, an ASCII code or an hexadecimal or any kind of uh, number system in the computer that uh, it can read. Okay, so in the coding, it is where the instruction is converted to understand which other parts of the CPU are needed to continue the operation. And then third is execute. It is where the operation is performed. Okay, so let's say you've asked your computer to calculate something so again 10 times 10 okay so it will fetch being decoded and then it will be executed okay so in execution that is where uh, it will be uh, solved by our uh, al or arithmetic arithmetic logic unit where in 10 times 10 is equals to 100 so uh, that's what's happening in execute and then uh, lastly it will uh, right back to your a uh, monitor it will be displayed to your monitor as 100 okay so for further understanding i have an example here so how does a processor work so in here we have the input devices so what are those uh, devices so it could be a uh, your mouse your keyboard what else well any input device and then it will be stored to your memory temporarily okay then next it will go to your control unit wherein uh, it is the one aligning the task uh, that that your computer needs to do or needs to finish the next it will be compare or it will be solved or it will be calculate 
by your ALU or your arithmetic logic unit. Then after computing, it will go back to your memory and then it will now be shown to your output devices, which is your monitor, of course. And here we have a storage devices. So let's say you have an input, okay? Say you uh, uploaded a file in your computer and then you want to save it to your hard disk drive. So this is where it will go, okay? So it doesn't need to go to control unit, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So it can go through straight to your permanent uh, hard drive, okay? So the next one is the real example. Okay, this is just the format and how things happen in a processor. So this one is an example in the real world. So step one, the control unit fetches the mad problem instructions and data from memory. So let's say you uh, input or press 100 times 48. Okay, and step two, the control unit decodes the mad problem instructions and sends the instructions and data to the arithmetic logic unit. So after fetching, it will be decoded by your control unit and then it will be a line up to the task that it needs to do. Okay, after lining up 100 times 48, it will be performed or it will be processed by the ALU to perform the arithmetic. Okay, it will solve 100 times 48. Well, of course, it's equal to 4,800. Then after that one, the results of the math problem are stored in memory. We're in write back, this one. Write back, so it will now be displayed to our monitor, to your monitor. So every instruction that you do or you want to your computer to do, it will always do those uh, four function fetching decoding executing and then store now let's talk about types of processor so most processors today are multi-core which means that the ic contains two or more processors for enhanced performance reduced power consumption and more efficient simultaneous processing of multiple tasks so what does it mean? So from the word itself, multi means more than one. So before we only have a single core, but nowadays mostly or all processors nowadays are multi-core. So maybe the minimum is dual core, that's already multi, it's plural. Yeah, dual core, quad core, octa core, what is 16? 16 core, 32 core, don't know, maybe there's even uh, 64 core. Next is parallel processing so it is a method in computing of running two or more processors to handle separate parts at the same time okay so for you to understand what is the meaning of parallel processing i have uh, a technology where in the use pipelining in processor so how does pipelining work so processor begins fetching the second instruction before it completes the machine cycle for the first instruction thus having a pipeline technology in processor executes faster so here the machine cycle without pipelining so like this so of course it will be fetch the code execute and store as always every instruction it will do those four steps okay so without the pipelining it's just a single core you know you have to finish first this instruction before you can uh, finish the second instruction and nowadays processors today's are multi-core so this one is an example of multi-core processor so it can do four tests at the same time meaning this is a quad core processor compared to this one this is a single core processor so in here it can do four instructions at the same time and since it's a multi-core processor it applies or it uses the technology with pipelining like this one so uh, even though you haven't finished the instruction 2 yet you can uh, proceed now to instruction 3 so same with instruction 4 so that's the benefits of having uh, a pipelining technology in your processor so the next one is thread in processor so threads in processor processor cores work simultaneously on related instructions called threads can be independent or part of larger tasks so for you to understand this one uh, in a fast way let's say 
this is a one application only so this application can be processed or can be finished in 10 seconds if it's a single core it will be finished in exactly 10 seconds but in here we have thread 1 and 2 as you can see right here so instead of 10 seconds it will be finished or it will, it will be processed in 5 seconds only so basically it will reduce the process time by half okay so that's the benefits of having uh, a multi-threaded processor so this one is a quad core processor and has uh, eight thread okay so that's the meaning of this core so next one are the families of processors so we have a server processors we have a desktop personal computer processors and then we have a notebook computer processors so from the word itself server so basically this one has a more core processor than the rest so this one has an 8 and then a minimum of 6 this one has a highest of 6 core some are quad some are dual core so that's a minimum and then for notebook we have uh, a dual core as a minimum and then a quad core well basically a personal computer is much more powerful than a notebook or a laptop computer okay and next is the processor cooling so in here we have two two ways to cool your processor so we have a heat sink and a liquid cooling technology so for heat sink uh, it uses air for liquids it's very obvious it uses a water okay so basically the, those two serves one purpose only you know to remove the heat or to to conduct heat away all right so next is cloud computing so cloud computing is a server that provide access to the sources with the use of internet okay so what is this cloud computing maybe you know the super basic uh cloud computing is a uh, cloud storage that's what we all know since we're always seeing that one you have an iCloud uh what else well, anything that you can store your storage for free or maybe for some uh, websites or for some cloud storage you have to pay monthly or yearly so what are the advantages of having a cloud computing so first of all accessibility okay so as long as you have an internet you can access the cloud itself okay and then second it's cost savings so if you're going to compare this one let's say you have a flash drive wherein uh, the price of that one is uh, 500 pesos for 16 gigabyte let's say that's just uh, an assumption but for cloud computing uh, you can avail up to let's say 100 gigabyte 100 gigabyte for uh, 200 pesos only okay in a year okay so that's uh, that's one benefit of having a cloud computing okay but the downside on that one is if you don't have an internet then you cannot access the cloud of course you cannot access your uh cloud storage and then third space saving of course so instead of uh carrying uh, a hard or external hard drive instead of carrying uh, a flash drive you can just uh have your phone or you can just have your laptop and then as long as you have an internet then you can uh, access your cloud storage and then scalability so instead of having a 16 gigabyte uh, flash drive you can have 100 gigabyte for you know much cheaper price next is the example of cloud computing services so as you can see right here we have four services so first is infrastructure as a service or the is so it manage IT infrastructure, provides computing architecture. So in here, any service that um, that has a computing, okay, is under IS. Okay, and then the next one is software as a service or SaaS. So it delivers or delivery of applications as a service can access via web browser. So in here. Uh, one good example of this one is a YouTube, a Facebook, uh, Instagram, any any software 
that you can access uh, in a web browser okay or a lightweight uh, application okay where in your accessing uh, their server next one is data as a server so this is what I'm talking about a while ago this is the cloud storage for the Apple I don't know the other counterparts because I don't really use uh, cloud storage but anyway this one is where you can save your files or where you can upload your files and then lastly is a platform as a service or pass so this one is made for developer or programmer so in here this is where they can uh, test their program so instead of uh, having an application to program instead of having your own storage uh, to create a program so you can use this one pass to create your own program via online or via uh, cloud computing the next one is data representation so in data representation we only have two we have analog and digital signals okay so for analog signals are con they are continuous and vary in strength and quality and then for digital signals are in one of two states only of course it's uh, it could be a zero or one so for zero is for off and then one for on all right so just like one for zero off and then one on so byte so what is this byte it consists of eight bits as a unit it represents a single character this one is actually a one byte eight bit so this one is one bit second bit third bit fourth fifth six seven eight so this one is eight bit equivalent to one byte so this one is an eight bit byte for the letter e so as i told you uh, a while ago once you click the letter e on your keyboard your computer will not uh, read it as letter e it will read it as an ascii code okay so for letter e it's zero one zero 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 one zero one okay for eight bit byte for the symbol of asterisk we have zero zero and so on and so forth so same with number six it has an equivalent ascii code okay so for you to understand this one a little bit more better i have a data representation here wherein it's an ASCII code so American standard code for information interchange so it is most widely used coding scheme to represent data so in here we have the ASCII code and then the symbol ASCII code and then the symbol so we have 0 to 9 A to Z and then those special characters okay so for example we have a symbol 0 as a uh, I press zero, um, my, my computer will read it as zero zero one one zero 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 and so on and so forth. Okay. Alright, so this is one good example of data representation. So again, as I told you a while ago, instead of uh having or instead of your computer uh reading it as letter T, uh, it will not read it as letter T. So letter T here is zero one zero one zero one zero zero. So that's the computer, uh, or that's how the computer will read it, okay? And then it will be processed by your computer, and then it will be displayed to your monitor as letter T because yeah, of course your computer is smart. Uh, uh, it easily converts or decodes those uh, analog. So the next one is memory so bytes and addressable memory so here's some example of memory sizes so we have here the term abbreviation approximate number of bytes exact number of bytes approximate number of pages of text so for kilobyte so the abbreviation of that one is kb means it's uh, approximate number of bytes is 1000 but the exact number of that one is actually 1024 not not exactly 1000 but 1024 approximate number of pages of text is one half and then for megabyte so as i told you about google megabyte is a million so the approximation is a 1 million but the exact byte is 1,048,576 and then 500 
pages of text and then for a gigabyte of course it's billion uh, billion whatever and then here's the exact number of bytes and then for a terabyte it's one trillion and then here's the exact number of bytes okay so here's one fun fact uh, regarding with our flash drive so yeah you have a 16 gigabyte flash drive uh, so you're, you're expecting that it is exactly 16 gigabyte but in reality it's like 14 point something gigabyte only okay because uh, your flash drive is displaying it as an approximate uh, number of bytes we're in 16 is 16 supposedly but the exact number of bytes in our computer is 1024 is 1 gigabyte okay so that is why instead of having 16 gigabyte you will only get 14 point something gigabyte okay so that's uh, what's happening uh, well, why, why uh, we're having uh, a less lesser storage of that uh, flash drive okay so the next one is the types of memory so in here we have volatile memory and a non-volatile memory so for volatile memory it loses its contents when power is turned off so one good example of that one is a ram so ram is like what is that one again it's a random access memory or a cold mean memory so as we all know ram stores uh information temporarily only so it's uh, not permanent unlike non-volatile memory it does not lose contents when when power is removed so example of uh, non-volatile memory are rom or a flash memory and a cmos wherein rom is a read only memory wherein it stores permanent data okay so here's the types of ram chips so we have dynamic RAM or uh, they read this one as DRAM so must be re-energized constantly or they lose their contents so this one is an example of RAM so again those RAM only uh, stores uh, information temporarily all right so same with your SRAM and then MRAM so for static RAM so this one is a little bit better because this one is uh, faster and more reliable than DRAM so you do not have to re-energize as often as DRAM and then for magneto resistor RAM or the MRAM so it is a newer type of RAM so this one is a newer type of RAM that stores data using magnetic charges instead of electrical charges so it has a greater storage capacity consumes less power and has faster access time than electronic RAM so the best one on this one is of course the MRAM okay so here's some um, uh, common DRAM variations so the first one is SDRAM or the synchronous DRAM so it is synchronized to the system clock it is much faster than DRAM actually and then DDR SDRAM so this one is a double data rate SDRAM so basically this is just an, an upgrade of SDRAM same with this one an, an upgrade of DDR SDRAM so we have here the second generation DDR2, third generation DDR3, fourth generation, and so on and so forth. Nowadays we have DDR5, so this one is not updated anymore. Alright, so next one is the types of memory module. So in here we have three, SIM, DIM, and then RIM. Alright, so this one is pretty obvious. For SIM, it's single inline memory module, so it has pins on opposite sides of the circuit board that connect together to form a single set of contacts. So this is the SIM. And then DIM. So DIM is dual inline memory module. Pins on opposite sides of circuit board do not connect, thus forming two sets of contacts. RIM stands for Rambus inline memory module. It houses RD RAM chips. So again, SIM it's a single set of contact this one doesn't have a notch unlike a dim it's a dual inline memory module wherein it has a notch wherein forming 
two sets of contacts. So this one, one set of contact only. But for dim, it has two sets of contact having a notch in the middle. So basically, this one is twice faster than this one. It's like, you know, this one is a single core, this one is dual core, something like that. And then for Rumble's inline memory module, it has two notch. Okay, so this one is basically faster than a dim. Memory cache. So it speeds the process of the computer because it stores frequently used instructions and data. So uh, basically our processors nowadays already has a cache. A cache uh, can store uh, small information. Okay, so in this one we have L1 cache which is uh, the fastest access. It is part of processor. And then here we have a slower than L1, which is the L2. So as you can see right here, the higher the number of cache, the slower. So it's like this is what is the priority when it comes to a searching. So fastest, slower a little. L3 is of course uh, a separate chip between processor. So this one is slower than L2 and L1, of course. It's pretty obvious. And then uh, lastly, or not actually the last one, we have a RAM, it's slower access than L1, L2, and L3, okay? So, uh, if, let's say, if your processor cannot find that information in L1, it will go to L2. If it cannot find on L2, it will go to L3. If it cannot find uh, in L3, it will go to your RAM. This is not actually the last one, as I told you a while ago. So it, if it if it cannot find on the RAM, it will go to your ROM, okay? Which is, of course, is slower than RAM, slower than L3, slower than L2, and slower than L1. So that's how our processor search for an, a certain information, okay? So from L1 to L3, to RAM, and then to your RAM or to your hard disk drive, okay? So that's uh, how memory cache works. Okay, so let me just give you an example. Uh, we have a lot of cache uh, files in our computers. So uh, maybe some of you, once you've heard the word cache, ah, it's just a temporary file. You don't really need that one, like something like that. So basically, you're, ju you're just going to delete that one. Well, nothing, yeah, nothing will happen uh, upon deleting the cache. Well, in fact, you can uh, see more search. It can expand your search because uh, uh, cache consumes uh, storage or consumes uh, a memory. Okay, but didn't you know that those cache are actually like uh, a configuration for your computer to access the file or for your computer to open a certain file uh, much faster? Okay, so let me just give an example. So, uh, upon opening a new, uh, newly installed application, uh, it opens uh, quite slow. Compared to an application that you always use frequently, it opens pretty fast actually. How did that happen? Because in a newly installed application, there is no certain information of or there is no certain configuration of that application on your processor but if you have but if you have uh, the cache file or the configuration file of that uh, application then it is much much faster to search or it is much much faster to open that application okay so that's how memory cache work in our computer the next one is the types of memory cache so we have here the l1 l2 and l3 so l1 is built directly in the processor chip has a very small capacity ranging from 8 kilobyte to 180 128 kilobyte so common sizes for pcs are 32 kilobyte or 64 kilobyte 
then L2 is slightly slower than L1 cache but has a much larger capacity ranging from 64 kilobyte to 16 megabyte so it can accommodate or it has a larger capacity but slower uh, than L1 and then L3 cache is a cache on the motherboard that is separate from the processor chip so it exists only on computers that use L2 advanced transfer cache so some motherboards doesn't support L3 cache some motherboards or most motherboards nowadays actually our modern motherboards support this one okay it has an L3 cache but mostly uh, before we only have L1 and L2 cache okay so again L1 is the fastest L2 is uh, quite slower a little slower than L1 and then L3 is of course slower than L2 and L1 so as I told you a while ago here's the search order when CPU needs data or instruction so first it will go to your L1 next is L2 next is L3 and then fourth one is a ROM and then the last one is your uh, hard disk or your ROM okay and if it's uh, I cannot still find the information that is uh, looking for then that's it so yeah it will stop right there okay all right so ROM versus ROM versus same so what are their differences so for rom it's read only memory so it refers to memory chips storing permanent data and instructions so it's pretty obvious and then ram is a random access memory it allows information to be stored and retrieved on a computer okay so a rom is your hard disk drive where you can store uh permanent data and for rom it is a random access memory we're in uh, upon the main usage of RAM is it uh, it is where the applications open application or a running application uh, stores uh, store uh, one application is of course your operating system and other application that is currently open and then lastly is CMOS so it stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductor so what is this CMOS? So it stores the basic configuration of a computer. So this CMOS is the CMOS battery, you know, like the battery of a watch. Okay. So it is where the basic configuration of a computer saves. So for example, is the date and the time. Okay. Maybe some of you are wondering, ah, oh, my, my, my personal uh, computer is already uh, shut down. It doesn't have an el electricity anymore but upon opening the computer uh, it can still retrieve the basic configuration of, of your computer so that is a big thanks to a CMOS battery okay so that's the role of CMOS battery uh, having or saving or it stores the basic configuration of a computer next one is adapter card so what is adapter card or what is an adapter card so it enhances functions of a component of a desktop or server system unit and or provide the connections to peripherals such as sound card or a graphics card so where do you put those adapter cards so it is in expansion slots so it is a socket on a desktop or server motherboard that can hold an adapter so those are some examples which is a very old picture of a motherboard and a graphics card or a video card and a sound card and the motherboard itself anyway next one is sports for computer and mobile devices so for display devices we have three we have the vga uh, DVI and then the HDMI port all right so today this is the latest the HDMI okay so this is the best one among those three and then VGA this is like the old one but still good okay and then DVI port is like for basically this one is for PC only but I don't know, some PC is using this one but some are using this one and also some are using this one especially if you have a graphics card 
all right and then for networking we have the ethernet part so nothing has changed in this one so there is no uh innovation when it comes to ethernet part Next is ports for computers and mobile devices. So for audio, we have three, a blue one, a green one, and then the pink one. So this pink one is for your microphone. This one is for your uh, earphones or headset or headphones. And this one is for your line-in or for your speaker. And then for other input, output, and storage devices, we have your USB ports. So we have here the white one, which is the 2.0, and then we have the blue one for the 3.0. Nowadays, we have the 3.1. Uh, I guess the color of that one is black instead of blue. Next is basses. So we have here the processor and then your... Uh, RAM or memory chips. So what what is BAS or what are BASes? So it allow various devices both inside and attached to the system unit to communicate with each other. So we have a, a data bus, we have an address bus, and then a control bus. Okay. So word size is the number of bits the processor can interpret and execute at a given time. So as you can see right here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this RAM is like basically having 8 buses or 8 terminals. Yeah, something like that. So the more, the ba more buses, of course, uh, the better, the faster it is. Okay. So this is like a road. As you can see. So the wider the road, the better. The uh, Yeah, the larger or the bigger or the more uh, information that it can carry to your processor or to your RAM. So here's some types of buses. We have system bus, backside bus, and then expansion bus. Basically, you know, the ports, the, the uh, backline ports, are, uh, those are actually buses. Okay, system bus is what is the one that is inside, and then expansion bus is the one that is in adapter or expansion slot. Okay, so system bus, also called the front side bus or FSB, is part of the motherboard and connects the processor to main memory, and then a backside bus or BSB connects the processor to cache. And then expansion bus allows the processor to communicate with peripheral devices. So lastly is keeping your computer or mobile device clean. So clean your computer or mobile device once or twice a year. So <laughs> this one depends on the person. Okay, so if you're the kind of person uh, who takes care of, of your computer, then maybe you will do this one. And for some... Uh, PC lover or computer lover, I, I guess they clean their PC every day or maybe weekly or monthly, not just twice a year or once a year. Well, of course, this one is <laughs> pretty obvious. Turn off and unplug your computer or mobile device before cleaning it. Okay, so you don't, you don't, you don't need to uh risk your life in cleaning your computer you can turn it off and then clean it after so be sure to unplug your uh computer before cleaning it okay and then use compressed air to blow away dust okay and then use an anti-static wipe to clean the exterior of the case and a cleaning solution and sub cloth to clean the screen all right so as you can see right here i made uh i made this slides or i summarize the summarize uh pdf for me to make this video uh shorter okay because i don't want to uh took this one long because you know i i know that if it's too long it's uh it will become boring so i i make i made this video short as possible okay well, anyway, that's it for module 1. Uh, wait for my next video on module 2. Okay.
Well, see ya, bye bye. Well, I think if you guys have a question, you can message me directly. Okay, if there's a part in my uh, presentation right now that you didn't understand that needs uh, more explanation, then you can message me directly. So no, no problem with that. Anyway, bye bye.